feedback and questions from you throughout the webinar. And since we always have a lot of questions, we were going to get through the presentation in 30 minutes and spend 10 to 15 minutes in our question and answer session. To facilitate the discussion, we'll use two features of the webinar software. The first is the viewer window, where you'll see the presentation, and which I recommend maximizing now so you can see it in full screen. The second is the control panel, where you can interact with us. The control panel can be opened and closed by clicking on the arrow button on the gray tab. In the control panel, you're welcome to submit questions and comments to our presenters. We'll be answering as many of these as possible throughout at the end of the webinar and throughout the presentation. Our presenter today is Dennis Sozloff. Dennis is a consultant at Capronasia Shanghai and is joining us from Capronasia's head office here in Shanghai. As one of Asia's leading providers of independent research, custom consulting, and advisory services focusing on the financial industry and financial technology, Capronasia helps clients understand and navigate the challenges they face in a challenging region with a rapidly changing business, operational, and technological environment. To tell us more about digital payments in China, here's Dennis. Uh, uh, hi everyone, thanks Zanin. Uh, my name is Dennis Suzlov I'm, and I'm an analyst with Capron Asia. Um, so today I'll be talking about digital payments in China and about the recent trends and our projections for future. Uh, switching to the first slide, uh, this slide shows the um, PSP, which are um, payment service providers, trans uh, transactions volume and we see that and the volume uh, had incredible growth over the recent few years and the growth will continue. Uh, what is especially interesting about the year 2015 is that the mobile payments exceeded online payments. Um, payments made on uh, desktop computers for the first time uh, and it's a really important trend. China really leads um, the world in terms of adoption of mobile payments. Um, so looking at this impressive and incredible growth, one might think that PSPs, um, service providers, payment service providers, are doing really well because the transactions are growing, so their revenues um, are supposed to grow as well. But um, this is uh, not necessarily the case, um, and um, I will talk about the reason in the, on the next slide. So right now in China, Payments for consumers are free or mostly free. So if you take your Alipay wallet and make a payment, send money to someone else, to a friend um, or whoever, it's, it's free for you, uh, even though just recently it, it was completely different. Online banks used to charge for those kind of payments, but right now it's completely free and we really see how uh, that this kind of disruption was really uh, brought by internet companies by the BAT, Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent. Um, so how they do that? Well, they subsidize the cost because for, for PSPs the payments are not free. They have to pay banks for the infrastructure that they use to, um, to make those payments. So for example, Tencent has reported in their quarterly call with investors that in January alone they paid 300 million RMB to banks for using their infrastructure. This is a huge number, but yet it's completely free for users. So we can see how these PSPs are subsidizing payments uh, to make them completely free for their users. Uh, and here uh, it's important to know that uh, there are some uh, recent uh, events uh, which show that still some companies try to charge, like Tencent has introduced 0.1% fee for withdrawal. So it means once you charge the wallet and make a payment, it's free, but if you want to withdraw the money, still there is a there is a little fee, but other PSPs like Alipay still <coughs> keeps those pay payments free, uh, which is um, really interesting to understand how they they make the business uh, profitable. Well, here we talk. Um, we we found two ways how they offset these costs. Uh, first, um, um, so these PSPs are turning their massive traffic wallets into shopping platforms. Uh, basically, they use these wallets to sell other services and products. Let's look at the screenshot on the left. It shows a screenshot 
screenshot of a uh, Alipay wallet and you can see that payments and payment related icons take really take less than 25% of the screen. All other screen space is devoted to showcasing other products and services. And table on the right shows like um, how uh, shows all the breadth of offerings that offered by these PSPs. For example, Alipay. Uh, using Alipay wallet, you can uh, pay your credit card debt. You can pay for utilities bills. Um, even if you go to hospital, you can use the wallet to to uh, get the ticket for, uh, for queuing. You can hail taxi, top up your mobile, and uh, there is even e-commerce. So it's it's really incredible amount of of uh, services and products available there. Uh, so so um, and also um, the next slide you see that. Uh, many of these services and companies offered by Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent are actually owned by these companies because they're huge conglomerates, they're groups of companies, and it helps them to drive revenue and to keep all the revenue uh, in-house uh, in the, these groups of companies. So, for example, Alibaba uh, has their own maps. Uh, they invested in China's coupon company, Jinping Meituan, which, which is really... A large and successful company. They have group buying. They have taxi services, DDQID. Um, they have. They even have their own food delivery and um, and travel service. Um, and if we look um, horizontally, uh, we also see how tough competition is. As these giants basically branch out to all uh, to all businesses possible, it means the competition is really tough. Like. Baidu offers maps, so does Alibaba, and uh, so does Tencent. And the same is for some other services like Taxi. Baidu has invested in Uber, and Alibaba uh, partnered with Tencent to invest in DDQID. Um, right, so the first way, we've just saw the first way branching out into other services and using wallets to uh, this high traffic wallets to sell the services. That was the first way. And the second way is really about data. These companies mine consumer data to um, make their products better, to tailor make these products, which results in, uh, in better sales uh, and to increase user stickiness. Uh, here what's important here is the importance of payments data. Uh, many of the leading technology companies uh, gather and collect consumer data from their um, from from their online behavior. Like Baidu collects your uh, search data, so Baidu knows what you're interested in, what you look for. Um, but actually, payments data is even more important because uh, payments data actually shows companies uh, what you buy. Um, how do you pay and uh, what's your how reliable you are what your credit is so that's why it seems like everyone in China now is getting into payments for example Wanda uh, Wanda group which is um, a Chinese conglomerate which started from shopping malls here in China it, uh, it paid uh, RMB 2 billion for for a payments company called 99 bill so why did they do that well they want consumers to use these 99 bill wallets on their mobile phones when they visit their shopping malls. This way they can connect consumers with the almost half a million of post terminals, of smart post terminals installed in these shopping malls. And this data gives Wanda a lot. Uh, based on that data, Wanda can offer uh, coupons, telemail coupons, and even move into finance. For example, offer credit uh, uh, lend to merchants and consumers, and of course they can improve customer experience this way. And there are also there are some very interesting use cases how these companies use um, payments data in other areas. For example, Sesame Credit is um, the arm of and financial responsible for credit scoring. Basically, they collect payments data and then assign. Uh, 
credit scores to, to, to their users. And then using Sesame Credit credit scores, um, consumers can apply even for such things as visa. Uh, for example, uh, they can apply for European Union visas with their scores and obtain it in a more easier way. Also, which is especially new, um, consumers here in China can actually use their Sesame Credit credit scores at McDonald's to borrow umbrellas. If, um, if the score is high enough, they don't even have to pay or just have to pay very little to borrow an umbrella. Right, so we talk about these payments uh, payment service providers, how they, they've been changing their business model to focus on mining data <clears throat> and um, using their high traffic uh, wallets. But at the same time, uh, banks, traditional Ch Chinese traditional financial institutions have been left behind. These banks and, and CUP as well, they have a massive merchant and user base but have been unable to capitalize on digital payments so far. Uh, PSPs uh, started from digital payments, from online and mobile payments, but now are very quickly moving into physical pause. So consumers here in China can use their mobile phones to pay in convenience stores, um, and th this is all is based on QR code technology. Um, what's, uh, what's very interesting here is actually banks were not just um, letting PSPs do that. They, they were trying to launch their own NFC, uh, to launch their own wallet, usually were based on NFC technology, but they never were really successful. People are just not using those wallets either by banks or either developed by banks or China Union Pay. Um, and um, these banks, uh, so they were they have been left behind, and it uh, had two two implications for them. Uh, so the first one is that Chinese banks have um, have lost uh, 152 billion RMB. Uh, in, um, in year 2015. This is according to our calculations and we made projections. So banks will lose uh, almost 400 billion to third-party payment providers um, uh, in, in years up to 2020. This is of course not what they, they like to, um, to see. Uh, the second implication has been a tremendous loss of transaction data. This, um, this graph here shows a uh, bank statement uh, and basically this means uh, it shows what banks actually see from the user transactions which uh, users add their bank cards to their Alipay or Tencent wallet and when they make the payment banks do not see where um, those consumers are spending their money, which restaurant or which shop is that. They can only see the name of the payment company, the name of the PSP that helps to process that data. Uh, and what this means, uh, they are losing this data and they cannot offer additional value add services. Uh, for example, previously they could see if a certain consumer likes to, um, to, likes to, to eat in fast food restaurants, they would offer coupons or say if consumer bought a new car, banks would know that from the name of, of a car dealership and offer uh, for example, car insurance, um, which is, was a good way to, to drive additional profits. So now uh, we saw that China Union Pay and banks have been left behind and they really were looking for a solution for something that could help them to gain their market share back. And uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting that they actually had to turn to Apple, an international company, because seems like this was the only company that could really drive consumer adoption uh, in in no, number large enough to create this momentum it's it's it's, it's incredible if you consider how protective re regulations have always been in china basically foreign banks have less than 2% of the market in china right now and there are no foreign payment companies operating in the domestic market and yet china union pay <clears throat> the monopolist and banks ha uh, had to cooperate with Apple because they they really didn't see any other uh, solution for their problem. 
Um, so moving on to the Apple Pay launch, the service, uh, first rumors about negotiations between China Union Pay and Apple um, uh, appeared in 2014 and then the official announcement was made in 2015. Uh, and Apple Pay finally was launched in February this year. It was a, a huge launch. Um, it really, um, all, all the partners like banks and CUP really invested a lot in, uh, in making this launch big. They invested in advertisement. Basically, in large cities like Shanghai, you could see the advertisement everywhere, including websites of banks and China Union Pay. Basically, what they achieved with that is that all Apple Pay, uh, all Apple phone owners were aware of the launch of the new service. <clears throat> uh, and yet, the uptake has been really slow so far. Uh, first of all, we want uh, to talk about some of the reasons uh, of that. So on this table, this table shows functionality and it really shows how limited the functionality was of Apple Pay. Um, you can you basically can only use Apple Pay to pay offline and um, online, but you cannot receive or send payments. Uh, you cannot even withdraw money or se uh, send it to a second party bank card, uh, just bank card of someone else. Uh, and it's really not something that consumers are used to. Consumers are used to um, all the options that other wallets like Alipay offer. Um, so, uh, let's move to the second slide, and and it's Apple Pay. St still, we we ha uh, we have to say that Apple Pay launch was a very important event for the payments industry in China. Basically, <clears throat> uh, this company has inspired Samsung, Xiaomi, and Huawei to launch their own payments, and these are all very large manufacturers, very successful and their combined market share is at least 40% um, in China. So this really has created momentum. And um, what's interesting about Samsung, actually Samsung Pay's technology is based on magnetic stripes, so people can um, use their phones to pay in um, on all post terminals. It doesn't have to be a new NFC enabled post terminal, it can be any any of the terminals, which means all, all of the terminals can accept that payment method. Um, uh, here uh, I would like to mention that basically how the competition in China, how it looks like, like in China now, there are privately owned, usually technology giant backed PSPs that and their payments are based on QR codes. And then there are China Union Pay banks and device manufacturers, and their solutions are based on NFC. So this, this really creates this NFC versus QR code dynamics. Um, uh, and, and let's look at this technology side by side and compare that. So if you look at traditional POS acceptance, then Samsung Pay's acceptance is, is really high. Why? QR code, while QR code is low, that's why all the merchants have to buy the, the new scanners to be able to pres, uh, proceed these QR codes. Uh, phone enable, phones enabled at the same time, for the MS, MST technology you really have to have a Samsung phone and that's why the um, penetration is, is very low. At the same time for NFC it's a bit better there are more and more new models with, that support NFC and combined market share of Apple, Xiaomi, Huawei and Samsung is, is quite quite good. <clears throat> at, the same, at the same time, this, uh, for QR codes that's not, not a problem at all because almost all phones are smartphones now in China and all these phones can produce QR codes <clears throat> uh, which is really good and makes it uh, easy to accept everywhere. Um, also, finally, I want to talk about attractive, attractiveness for banks. So I mentioned before, QR codes are not attractive to banks because QR codes are mostly used by uh, PSP companies. 
but NFC <clears throat> and Apple Pay are very attractive for banks because if, if you look at the table below, again, with this payment method, banks can see the data and can gather it and collect the data. They can see if a person used the, their payment method in a family mart or whether it was a license um, convenience store. Uh, with this payment methods, they really see this data. And uh, shifting to the next slide, um, Apple Pay uh, it just confirms that Apple Pay shows this data for, for the banks. All right, so we've talked about Apple Pay uh, and how it changed the dynamics in China. And now I would like to move to the next topic, which is regulation in China. <clears throat> First of all, let's, let's look at some of the issues um, that are challenging China's payments industry right now. First is knowing your customer. For a long time, the only thing you needed to register an account with a payment service provider was an email address only. So, which could be completely anonymous. You could just have a random email address and register an account and then start sending money. So that's a big problem for fighting um, financial crime like money laundering. And uh, a lot of consumers really had, re really didn't have their real names and their identities linked to their payment methods. Like uh, 300 million out of 600 million Alipay users are still not real name. <clears throat> right. Second are the deposit risks. So basically what happened in China is that many of these PSPs in fact hold funds of, of their users. They hold these deposits, but these deposits are not co covered by the insurance, and, uh, while bank de uh, deposits are covered by the insurance. And the sums are uh, very substantial. <clears throat> For instance, um, Alipay ha holds as much as 110 RMB billion of customer accounts. Also, these PSPs, especially some of the smaller ones, were, uh, were becoming a payments channel for online platforms, some of which are really <clears throat> risky in China. Um, for, for instance, those peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, um, companies, um, there are just um, a lot of these companies, more than 2,000, and s some of them are quite shady and there were uh, a couple of very big scandals um, here in China this and last year where some of these peer-to-peer -peer peer companies went bankrupt and just disappeared with uh, their customers' money. So, so all this was happening just because there were these PSP companies. Um, finally, the issue of unclear rules and definitions in the industry. Uh, uh, for instance, there was a ca case where a lawyer, a lawyer in China has sued Meituan Dianping, which is a, a multi-billion dollar company, because the company was accepting payments from consumers and was holding that money, but the company didn't really have a payments license. So. Industry players really want the rules to be defined more, uh, more clearly, and just to, to make to make sure what a company can do without a license and what it what it can do with a license. All right. So to address these issues, new guidelines were issued. Guidelines called. Uh, called guidelines for non-bank financial institutions engaging in internet payments. <clears throat> they were published in December 2015 and aimed to solve most of the problems that we just talked about. <clears throat> the, uh, these guidelines came in fact uh, July 1st this year um, and uh, uh, but unfortunately implementation has been slow so far. Uh, we, uh, and there were reports that consumers still can register <clears throat> new accounts without providing sufficient identification and then <clears throat> basically send money or invest and that's and because of that the regulator the PBRC has delayed um, the deadline until November the 1st. 
Uh, let's quickly look at some of the measures that these guidelines take and what effect on the industry these guidelines will have. Um, so first, payment amounts were restricted, basically encouraging consumers to complete their larger size transactions over internet banking channels, um, which are considered to be safer. <clears throat> uh, also, um, new Know Your Customer measures were introduced. Basically, if you want to make large, large transactions or if you want to invest in online internet products from your wallet, you, you have to provide more identification methods that you, you had before. Um, these include multiple IDs, um, mobile phones, um, and other things. Um, and finally, um, uh, the regulators um, uh, want to ban PSP opening accounts for opening accounts for online financial companies, but this is still tentative and um, will be announced later. Once it, it is, once the rule is introduced, uh, a lot of Chinese uh, P2P companies will have to hold <coughs> their funds in traditional banks' accounts. Uh, right, and now moving on to another important part of, part of regulation in China, um, which are payment licenses. So, first and second batches were issued five in 2011, and now they're expiring. And initially, the central bank has issued uh, quite a large number of these licenses. Right now, there are more than 200, uh, around 240 licenses, and the problem is that many of them are not used. There's a clearly, the l number is too large and there are zombie companies which just sit there, were registered specifically to hold the license, but are not using them. And, uh, yet, uh, many of the license holders that are using the licenses are operating at loss. And the central bank really wants to regulate the industry. It has already st uh, stopped License, new license issuance in large cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and also in Zhejiang province. And the re regulator is also encouraging um, mergers and acquisition. It's encouraging consolidation in, in the industry, but even though not pure license buying. And uh, and yet we see the demand for these licenses. <clears throat> large companies from all kinds of industries are looking. Um, to, ha to have a license to be able to process payments. <clears throat> the, uh, such companies as Chihu 360, which is a software maker, or China Pacific Insurance, which is an insurer, GRG, which is an ATM maker, Tenu, which is a bank software maker, are all in line for new licenses. And they really need this uh, because having your own wallet really uh, creates a new distribution channel. Uh, and also they want to be, a to be able to process um, these payments in-house and thus have more control. Um, all right, so we've discussed licenses and just I would like to summarize what we've talked about today. Um, so we've t we, uh, we've, I've mentioned how business model for digital payments is, is really changing in China. Um, because these uh, payments are free for consumers, <clears throat> and yet they, and yet PSPs incur a cost. Uh, PSPs had to find another ways, another ways to make money. Uh, so they do that by leveraging payments traffic, and also they mine data to create additional value. Uh, and they've done that very successfully, but banks and China Union Pay were left behind. And they are losing payment fees, and also, more importantly, they're losing data. Uh, because they also, it's, for, it's as important for them as it is for the BAT companies. Um, so Apple Pay ent entered the industry, and uh, this is kind of traditional solution that could make banks relevant again. Uh, first of all, Apple Pay, which is based on NFC, exposes more transaction data to banks. Uh, and also, Samsung has also entered the industry. Um, 
Right, and in, in the end we also talked about regulation and the new regulation, the new guidelines, which are really uh, can can really be consider, considered more mature regulation. The last de decade has saw an incredible development in payments, but regulation was lacking, and now regulators are finally implementing new regulations, which will make the industry less risky, but better for consumers. Great. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so Dennis took us through and gave us an idea of kind of what's happening in the market, how the business model is changing, uh, the how we're shifting towards this use of data. Uh, during the webinar, we've had multiple questions come in in the background, uh, mainly about competition, it seems. I mean, it seems like a lot of people are really concerned with, okay, so what 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 does this mean for uh, players in the industry? Uh, Dennis, one of the questions is we have from Annabelle, and Annabelle asks, will Apple Pay eventually be able to make a significant impact? So you talked about, how, um, Dennis, you talked about how Apple Pay has been really slow to start in China, does it have a possibility long term of being successful in the Chinese market? Um, well, yeah, Apple Pay uptake has been very slow so far, um, and there were recent services. Though there is no official data yet, uh, some of the service consumer service show that <clears throat> consumers really just find it exciting enough. To switch their payment methods, they're completely satisfied with what they have right now from Alipay or WeChat Pay. Uh, they really like those two payment methods, and they, they don't see any reasons to switch. So we, we think Apple Pay and uh, just payment methods uh, like NFC payment methods, maybe offered by Xiaomi or Huawei, probably will have some market share, but very small one. Um, uh, maybe not exceeding like five percent of of the market. Um, what's also interesting here, there still there is a chance for these payment methods because uh, transportation, paying for transportation, uh, haven't been streamlined in China yet. Um, for example, in Hong Kong, it's very convenient to use the same card for convenience stores and for metro and buses, but in China, these are transportation cards, and we're really we're sure that eventually that will move to paying with your mobile phone for transportation, either bus or metro. Um, but that's haven't happened yet. And QR codes, we think QR codes just are not fast um, and not reliable enough. So that really gives Apple Pay and other NFC-based payment methods, um, gives them a chance in China. Thanks, Dennis. That's great. Um, we've gotten a couple of other questions about offline usage of some of these payment methods. Uh, so there, there's a couple of different people that have asked questions about the actual penetration. Now, I mean, you and I know from our work, Dennis, that actual numbers about offline penetration is, uh, let's just say, difficult to find so far in the market in terms of how many how many stores are actually using QR codes. But I mean, from your experience, maybe you can tell a little bit more about what you've seen in the market. I mean, do you use these payment methods on a daily basis? And if you were to estimate, you know, of the stores in a, in a city like Shanghai, uh, what percentage do you think are using these? All right, so I think that's around 20% um, of all payments in Tier one cities in large cities, um, twenty percent goes to mobile payments. So people use their mobile phones mo mostly with QR codes to pay for um, either in convenience stores or at restaurants. So th that's around twenty percent. Um, and what's especially interesting is Alipay. Alipay wallet really seemed to be dominating the industry just one or two years ago, but WeChat Pay was really fast to catch up. Because um, uh, because it's very fast and it, it works um, even faster than Alipay's wallet, and uh, it gains some of market share. So of those 20%, um, I think a bit more than half goes to Alipay, and a bit less than half goes to WeChat Pay. Yeah, I know. Just speaking from my personal experience uh, today, I realized that I went for a two-hour. Um, for some meetings and lunch and over that course of that two hours i paid for about five things and it was using my mobile phone 
uh, every time. So the, the the level of penetration certainly that I've seen since I've been here in China is is quite strong as well. Um, there's a question from Alan, and Alan was asking. Uh, what about other markets outside of China? I mean, we see all of the penetration here in China of these uh, these mobile payment platforms that are being provided by these PSPs. What are the opportunities abroad, both for Alipay and and Tenpay when they move abroad, or you know, mobile payments in general? Or is this just a perfect storm that we're seeing here in China that's enabling this this disruption in mobile payments, or is it something that you think we could see outside of China as well? Well, yes, uh, I think there was a bit of perfect storm here in China um, for a number of reasons. Uh, <clears throat> maybe not necessarily mobile payment methods will become as, as successful in other markets, maybe just because people are used to paying with uh, credit cards and that works really well and that's very quick. So uh, it, it depends. It depends on the market. and. Um, Alipay, well, and domestic PSP is expanding abroad. Uh, that certainly might work, and right now we see uh, developments in that. Especially, this uh, PSP is targeting Chinese uh, tourists and Chinese consumers and business people going abroad and, and spending. So, uh, in certain Asian countries like Thailand, South Korea, and Japan, it's it's quite common now that Chinese tourists go and. Um, just use their Alipay or WeChat Pay to pay for um, services and goods over there, if that answers your question. Yeah, I think it definitely does. Um, there's kind of a two-part question here from Andy. Uh, and Andy is asking, you said at the opening that 20% of spending will be digital. Is that online shopping or just using the mobile phone to pay in physical stores? Uh, I, I can answer that one, actually. That represents all retail consumption. Uh, so that would include online and offline uh, retail consumption. So it really is a, a striking number um, and, and increasing rapidly. I mean, that that includes all of the shopping that you would see on the e-commerce sites like Taobao and Tmall, as well as what Dennis was pointing out in one of the previous questions, the QR code acceptance uh, in the stores themselves. Uh, Dennis, the second part of this question is, do these wallets, so the, the QR code wallets, do these work uh, when you're buying something online? Uh, if so, how do, they, how, how do they use the QR codes if you're buying something online? Uh, well, actually, no. If you buy online, the QR codes Used, but still, this wallet is used all the time. So, if you're using any app, like you want to buy a movie ticket, uh, you use an app for that in China. And when you check out and you want to pay for for that movie ticket, uh, you can pay with Alipay or WeChat Pay. Um, there are two options. Usually, if you have those two apps installed, you can choose pay with the apps, and then the interface of the app will pop up, and you input your code. If, if you don't have one of those apps, um, you, you basically, th there is still another option. You can go to the online and use the um, mobile phone's browser to go to, to the website of, say, Alipay, and then input your code and um, your ID, uh, um, your account number over there. But QR codes are definitely not used for online payments. Yeah, I think the the one thing that I've seen is if you check out on Tmall, you can you can authenticate that payment on your mobile phone by scanning a QR code that appears on your screen. But the the um, the kind of scanning the QR code on your phone, you don't you don't see it that often. Uh, there's another question here from Jack, uh, and so Jack asks a similar question to what Annabelle was asking about Apple Pay. What about CUP? What happened with CUP? It seemed like a couple of years ago, uh, you know, CUP and the telco providers would be the ones that were best positioned to really make an impact in mobile payments. But they, we really haven't seen anything. Uh, similar to the Apple Pay question, Jack is wondering, what is the future for these? Is there is there any chance uh, that China Union Pay will have a solution that fits? And if not, what is their role in the industry? All right. Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, well, Chinese Union Pay haven't been successful so far in building a customer-facing solution like an app that uh, people would actually use. It still plays some role in providing infrastructure. So, for some of the 
payments online, which um, called Quick Pay. Um, <clears throat> uh, China Union Pay actually still makes some money from making a switch uh, when payment goes between different banks. But in case of Alipay, now Alipay handles all of the transactions. So for that kind of payment, China Union Pay doesn't really uh, make any kind of fees from that. Um, What's really important to understand here is that China Union Pay is a state-owned company, and regulators usually tend to protect, um, uh, at least, uh, to tend, tend to protect interests of state-owned companies. So, so maybe we'll see regulation in future that would give some of the market share back to China Union Pay. But um, right now, at least. In terms of uh, solutions facing customer, they um, the future doesn't look so bright. I think. Great, thanks, Dennis. So we're reaching the end of the time that we have here for the webinar. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't unable to answer all of the questions that you guys submitted in the background. We have a couple more that we'll uh, answer uh, over email when we're when we're done with this webinar and we circulate the recording. As mentioned during the session, today's discussion was based on our latest digital payments in China research report detailing the present and future of digital payments in China, which is a part of our uh, available as part of our Capra. Asia subscription service or as an individual report. Uh, if you haven't already registered for this valuable service, it's something that we just launched this year and we're seeing a lot of uptake in this and uh, you have access to this report as well as many of the other reports that we publish throughout the year. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the things that we talked about today uh, in the webinar. Uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email in the next couple of days along with a link to the slides as well as the uh, recording itself. Uh, so if you know anybody else who might be interested in watching the recording but was unable to attend the recording, please let us know and we'll uh, send out the information to them. Uh, so if there's anything else that we can do for you, please let us know. Once again, Capron Nation appreciates your time today and hope you found the information informative and helpful. That concludes our webinar today. Thank you for joining us.